anything but not everything. Every decision that you make is a trade-off against something else, and that doesn't just apply to your money. It applies to your time, focus, energy, attention, anything in your life that's a scarce or limited resource. And that leads to two questions. Number one, what is most important to you? And number two, how do you align your daily decisions accordingly? Answering these two questions is a lifetime practice, and that's what this podcast is here to explore. My name is Paula Pant. I'm the host of the Afford Anything podcast, and today, my buddy, former financial planner Joe Saul Sihai, joins me on the show to answer questions that you, the community, have sent in. What's up, Joe? What's happening, Paula? We're going to change some lives today. Let's hope. Let's hope. Our first question comes from Julie. Hi, Paula. My name is Julie. I'm 27 and living in Vermont. I've always thought I was decent with money and have recently become interested in financial independence. In September, I paid off all my debt and in place of my loan payments began contributing 15% of my income to a Roth 401k. I also typically save about $400 per month in a local bank account and $75 per paycheck in my HSA. I currently have a net worth of approximately $23,000 made up of roughly $14,000 in my bank, $5,000 car, 2000 in my HSA, and 2000 in my 401k. My employer contributes $625 per year to my HSA, regardless of what I contribute, but does not have any sort of match to my 401k. I currently rent an apartment, though I do hope to become a homeowner in the next five years. I've been reading Thomas Stanley's Millionaire Next Door, and early on he explains how to determine if you're wealthy. His formula indicates you should have a wealth equal to your age, times realized pre-tax annual income divided by 10. My pre-tax income is about 35,000 per year. So according to his formula, I should have just under $95,000 to be considered average for my age and income. My question is, am I really that far behind? I'm saving close to a thousand per month, which is a little over 30% of my gross pay. Should I be saving more? Should I utilize different saving methods? I'm only beginning to gain wealth, but I already feel so far behind. Thank you for taking the time to answer my question. Your podcast has been a great resource for me. Julie, so it's funny that you asked this question because as of the time of this recording, just yesterday, I had an hour-long conversation with Thomas Stanley's daughter, Dr. Sarah Falla. By the time this episode comes out, she, I think, is going to be the following episode. So the week in which you listen to this episode, but as a sneak peek for what's coming up next week, Thomas Stanley's daughter, Sarah Falla, the author of The Next Millionaire Next Door, will be our guest on next week's episode. And as a preview, we actually discussed this question because if you use that formula, the expected net worth formula, when you are in your 20s, the math just does not work out. So let's walk through this. Let's imagine, hypothetically, that you're 22 years... I, I know, Julie, that you're 27, but I'm just going to go through this example for the sake of everybody listening, right? Imagine that you're 22 years old. You've just graduated from college. You have a starting salary of $60,000. You plug that into this formula. 22 times 60,000 divided by 10 equals 132,000. So according to this formula, a 22-year-old new college graduate should have a net worth of $132,000. Obviously, that doesn't make any sense. And you, you try this at a few different ages around your 20s, right? Take that same $60,000 salary, give it to somebody who's 25 years old. Well, 25 times 60,000 divided by 10 is 150,000. Eh, still doesn't work out. 28 times 60,000 divided by 10 is 168,000. Not that realistic. So, Julie, the fact that you're 27, this formula is not supposed to work at your age. And that is, and Thomas Stanley's daughter and I discussed this, and she admits in our interview, which you will hear next week, this formula is not designed for people in their 20s. The formula really is, is for people who are in their 40s and above. So don't worry, you're doing fine. I think she's doing fine too, Paula, because she's paid off all of her debt and she's 27 years old. How awesome is that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Everything that she said, she's doing great. When I turned 27, I was trying hard, Julie, to get into debt. So good, good for <laughs> you to, for, for going in the opposite direction. I used to get this question, when I was a financial planner, this was the most often asked question. 
how am I doing versus everybody else? How am I doing versus uh, some measure that has nothing to do with my goals? How am I doing versus these preconceived ideas that we have? For me, there's only one measure that's important. Am I on track to reach my goal? And so that's why I like working backwards and starting off with where do I want to be? What trajectory do I need to set today to reach that path? Now at 27, you don't know where you want to be at 60. I mean, maybe you do, but I know plenty of people that don't, but still directionally, I think when we talk about financial independence, we can start putting some numbers out there. We can say, okay, I'd like to live at least a similar lifestyle as I am now. And I'd like to have the ability to do what I want to by the time I'm 55 or 50 years old, wh whatever, whatever it is, I'm not going to put goals in your head, but start with that. Just some basic numbers. Then there are plenty of calculators online that will help you go back to today and then you'll know about the one calculation that really matters. Are you behind on getting that? Because making milestones and keeping up with those milestones toward your individual goal for me, far more important than a millionaire next door rule of thumb. Even if you're listening to this and you're in your fifties, I still don't really care about that measurement. I mean, real. What is wealth anyway? You know, I mean, I don't want to make this a huge philosophical decision, but I think we've done that a lot lately just in the financial independence community. What does it really mean to be wealthy? What is wealth actually for? What are we trying to do? And so I don't really subscribe to any of those numbers. So essentially stop comparing yourself to other people and compare yourself only to your own goals. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. How come you didn't say that first? <laughs> <laughs> well, I just thought it was perfect that she asked this question about the millionaire next door. And I've just spoken to the author's daughter. By the way, the, uh, the author himself, Dr. Thomas Stanley, passed away in 2015. Otherwise, I would have spoken to him directly. Sure. That, by the way, is a great book. And I'm not putting down the millionaire next door at all when I say that I don't care about that measurement because there are plenty of lessons in that book, most of which is that ostentatious displays do not equal wealth. Mm -hmm. The average millionaire, for those of you who are listening who haven't read the book, some of the key takeaways of that book include that the average American millionaire is a first-generation millionaire or a self-made millionaire, meaning that they did not inherit their money. The average American millionaire also has frugal tastes. They spend you know, very little money on their clothes. They don't have fancy watches. They drive mediocre cars. They live next door. They live in average homes. They're the people who, based on their lifestyle, you would never guess are millionaires. They tend to be very hardworking, but they're often in quote unquote non-glamorous jobs. So they're not Hollywood executives or you know, big New York City attorneys. I mean, there, sure, there are millionaires within those groups, but as an aggregate, the average American millionaire might own a pest control company or a welding company or a janitorial services company. So th those are some of the major takeaways from that book. And so th that book was originally written in 1996. And so uh, Dr. Sarah Fallow wrote this book, a follow-up called The Next Millionaire Next Door, that recently came out that takes all of that research and then updates it for more than 20 years later. And uh, something that I want to, to kind of clarify too, because I feel like sometimes Paula, and I don't know if you agree with this or not. Sometimes it feels like since the millionaire next door has grown into our culture and into our, and our lives and more and more people have read about that, that there's become some judgment among people about that's the way you should live if you want to be a millionaire. And if we go back 20 years ago, I think the point when that book was initially written, it was so shocking because I think what that was really showing is there is a path to seven figures that a lot of people hadn't even considered. And it's a path that far more people had taken than the average person thought about. They thought that if you drove an expensive car, you must be wealthy. Not at all the case. And I thought at the time it was groundbreaking. I feel like lately there are some people that look at people driving expensive cars or living in an expensive house and go, oh, you're clearly spending beyond your means, which isn't the case. And I don't think we really need to be judgy about each other's goals. 
but I remember how groundbreaking that was at the time that, wow, there's all these people that are masked from, you know, they're not the people that I think are millionaires. They're this whole other group of people. And that means that even if I have not huge income, there is a path for me to get there too. Right. It was very, it was shaking at the time that it came out. It was, it rocked a lot of people's assumptions about what a millionaire looked like, what a millionaire drove, what a millionaire wore, where a millionaire lived. It, it certainly rocked a lot of assumptions about lifestyle. And and in the FIRE community now, I agree with you, Joe, there is the assumption that if you drive a BMW, you must be spending above your means. But the fact of the matter is, we don't know what another person's balance sheet looks like. When we see somebody driving a car, regardless of whether that car is an 11-year-old Honda Civic or a brand new Lamborghini, we don't know what percentage of their net worth that car occupies. That being said, there are many of us in the FIRE community, myself included, who have a value system that states that regardless of how high our net worth gets, we would still never choose personally to drive a Lamborghini. It doesn't matter if I have 1 million or 10 million or 100 million, I still wouldn't do it. That being said, it's also not our place to judge others. It's only our place to make decisions about our own personal lives. Well, that's what I was thinking. If somebody's a car lover, if I was someone's financial planner and they told me that their goal is to own a Lamborghini, they don't care if they have to live in a tent guess what the goal is? The goal mm -hmm. is to get the Lamborghini and live in a tent. <laughs> uh, so, so, which is why I like comparing us to ourselves instead of to other people to get back to, to Julie's uh, question. Oh, that was a good way to circle it back. Hey, son. Hey, nice. Yeah. It. <laughs> wow. Look at that, Joe. Year, years of podcasting. <laughs> We're finally figuring out how to create nice narrative arcs. It's about time. I know, right? So, Julie, that is your takeaway from that question. Don't worry about comparing yourself to others. Just think about your own goals and whether or not you're on track to meet your own goals. Our next question comes from Anonymous. Hi, Paula. I'm a listener and fan of the podcast and a friendly participant on personal finance and FI Twitter. I work in finance, so I can't blog, but I'm very interested in FI principles, and I love the inspiring community that's out there. This is sort of a combo of success story and some questions for you. I'm 30, and I've been hustling my butt off for the last few years to rein in my spending, grow my income, and save. I have about 75% of my previous salary saved for retirement in mostly Roth accounts and was fortunate to get a really big raise this year, and I paid off the last of over $30,000 in student loans over this summer. This has freed up a significant amount, up to $3,000 a month of cash that I now have to try to decide what to do with. I would like to max out my 401k to help decrease my taxable income, and my husband and I have been saving up for a down payment for a house. I also know that in my industry, there's some lingering ageism for women and females over 50 are very scarce in the office. So I'm trying to build a life where I can enjoy my work and earn lots now, but I'm not dependent on that income after 50. I'm not sure if I'll retire or just move on to something else like writing, teaching, or I don't know, whatever sounds fun at the time. Because of this, I'm interested in rental property businesses for the future passive income stream. Is it better to not max out my 401k, take the tax, and use that extra savings to speed up growing a down payment fund? Or should I keep maxing out the 401k for the tax benefit and long-term retirement stability and be patient with saving up more cash to put towards a house and rental properties? Should I put less into a 401k and put some instead into a traditional Roth IRA and try to figure out a backdoor Roth? We're over the Roth IRA eligibility limit, and we could use some of that hypothetical converted Roth withdrawal in the future towards a house. I'm not sure. I'm worried I'm trying too hard to optimize and be ambitious, and I may be overcomplicating the taxes and accounts, and I'm not sure if it's worth it just to get a property a couple of years sooner. How would you best suggest thinking about the solution? Thanks so much. Wow, what a great question. And you know what I like most here, Paula? What's that? 
I like looking ahead at her career and kind of seeing where the ball is headed. And it, it doesn't mean that, that her career will have issues uh, with ageism, but seeing it now and starting to plan for the fact that that might happen, I think is wonderful. I love looking at these long-term goals as if you're an engineer and the way engineers plan is they look at everything that can go wrong and then they X out all of those things and have paths to victory, even if those things happen, or at least make sure that they minimize the chance of those happening. And then they build whatever the project is that they're building. I love that approach. I used to be on television in Detroit locally a couple times a week. I had uh, people that were stars on air locally who were clients of mine. And you would see men, and you still see it today, you'd see men that are on uh, television into their 70s or maybe even later. And women, when they would reach 45 or 50, for some reason, they'd always find a way to replace them with someone younger, which was frustrating. So I saw some of that firsthand. And I love the fact that she's looking ahead that far down the line to talk about maybe at the very least a career change, but wanting to have the flexibility to do whatever she wants. Mm -hmm. I also think that's very wise of her to Look at what's happening and assess the risks that lay ahead and whether or not those risks come to fruition, it's very, very solid to be prepared for them. Be prepared for the eventual what ifs. Yeah. I like the fact that she's looking at the different types of investments and asking herself how they interplay with each other. I would have a question back, which is, when would you like to be a landlord? If, it, and you know, and I'm hearing the uncertainty in her voice, I'll tell you this, because your opinion might change, I usually err on the side of flexibility. So the more money I can have in a position that's flexible, where I can change my mind later, I might give up a little bit of tax shelter so that I save myself down the road from having to use some obscure rule to get it money that I tried to be completely efficient with. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I agree with that as well. And the moment that she made that comment about the tax savings in a 401k or the tax efficiency of a 401k, do I give up the tax deferral? That immediately sent, I don't want to say a red flag, that's too strong of a word, but maybe an orange flag or a yellow yeah. flag. It kind of perked that up for me because you never want to make decisions based on tax efficiency. You want to make the decision that is best in your life. And once you make that decision, then you execute that decision in the most tax efficient manner possible. But start with the decision first and then tax optimize it rather than the other way around. And so anytime somebody asks a question that says, yeah, but I would be giving up the tax savings, that is in and of itself, is not a sufficient reason to make a major decision. So, Anonymous, in your case, the primary question is, do I want to, to bias my investments towards the market, or do I want to bias my investments towards buying a rental property as soon as I can? And that is the decision that you need to start with. And whichever choice you make, that's going to inform where you put your money. So don't even worry about the tax planning part of it because you know what? In rental properties, you get a bunch of tax advantages as well. In rental properties, your home depreciates, the building depreciates, meaning that even as you're collecting cash flow, much of the cash flow that you collect gets offset by the depreciation on the home, which means that that is, I don't want to say tax advantage to money, but that is tax happy money, so to speak. It plays by a, a separate set of tax rules than what you might be familiar with. And that's just one of many examples. You know, if you have a rental property and you decide to trade into a different one, you can use a 1031 exchange in order to, to defer the capital gains tax. There are so many, there's example after example of ways to tax optimize rental property investments. And the tax optimization, the tax deferral of a 401k is also great. So just don't make this a tax comparison game. Make it a question of what do I want to do and then do that and worry about the taxes later. Love it. Anonymous, your question of should I put money into a non-deductible traditional IRA and then use that to process a backdoor Roth conversion so that that way I can tap the contributions to the Roth if I want to use that as a down payment. 
I mean, are we talking about using this money as a down payment within the next few years, let's say five or fewer years? Because if that is the case, you might not want to have that money in the market anyway. So I'm with Joe. Put the money somewhere where it's flexible and you can just access it. I mean, if I were personally in your shoes and I wanted to save up money for a down payment, I'd just be storing that money in a savings account. I wouldn't even be trying to optimize it beyond that because a lot of people want to become hyper efficient with their money and and that's what leads them into spending their time figuring out how they can how they can take this money and put it into laddered CDs so that they can have a slightly higher return than what they're getting in a high yield savings account. And they spend so much time and cognitive bandwidth doing that that uh, that time and cognitive bandwidth has to come from somewhere. And that's time that you're not spending excelling at work and getting a promotion or learning more about investing strategy so that when you do purchase a property, you know how to identify a really good one. The time that you spend trying to optimize around where to hold what needs to be highly liquid savings, meaning that you're not really going to get good returns from it regardless of whether it's a a high yield savings account versus a laddered CD versus a money market account. Sure, we're you know, we're talking about fractions of a percent here. So rather than trying to optimize the peas, ignore the peas, focus on the steak. You shouldn't use analogies like that when I'm hungry. Okay, rather than trying to optimize the broccoli, does that make you less hungry? Brussels sprouts, cauliflower? Uh, I, I like all of those. Any of Don't, the side dishes? <laughs> right. Yeah, don't optimize the lima beans because they are horrible. (laughs) So thank you for asking that question. Our next question comes from Leslie. Hi, Paula. This is Leslie, and I'm a newer listener of the show. I'm calling to ask on behalf of my parents what you might recommend for their 401k investments. My dad is retiring in five years. He's the main provider for my parents, and my mom works part-time. Coming from a lower income household and despite being frugal, my parents have not been able to contribute to their 401k as much as they would have needed to over their lifetimes. Another impact to their 401k accounts was during the recession, they decided to pull out most of their retirement account money to use as a down payment for their current home as they saw steep losses to their accounts. Currently, they have about 30000 in a TSP Class G account and 35000 in a JP Morgan account invested heavily in equity securities. The JP Morgan account has been performing in line with the market and is now sustaining losses. I think they should wait it out for a few months hoping the market will go back and move their money to a more conservative account. Would you advise the same and what type of account should they move their money to? My sister and I plan to help them out as much as we can and they will also be getting rental property income from a second house they recently paid off. But overall, I'd really like to to help them preserve the money that they were able to save for retirement. Any advice would be highly appreciated. And thank you so much, Paula. Leslie, first of all, I think that is so admirable and so wonderful that you are, number one, very concerned about your parents and that you want to help them and support them. Number two, that you are asking these questions five years before that retirement. So you're looking out into the future as their daughter you're looking out into their future and thinking five years ahead as to what will happen then. I think it is fantastic that your parents have a fully paid off rental property, and that's going to be an excellent base for some of their retirement income. And I certainly do think that your instinct is correct in terms of if they are five years away from retirement, then having predominantly equities exposure in their investment account, their JP Morgan investment account, is not, that's not aligned with their timeline to retirement. You want to decrease your risk exposure, meaning less equities, more bonds as you approach retirement. And given the fact that your dad's going to be retiring in five years, that's the direction that you would want to move towards. Now, you'd asked whether or not to wait for a few months. I don't see any major reason to do that because it's very, very difficult to time the market. And we do not know what will happen in the market in the next any number of months. It could go up, it could go down, it could be 
the same. The fact of the matter is nobody has a crystal ball. Nobody knows. And so the only thing that we do know how to do is to align our our asset allocation, or in this case, your parents' asset allocation, in a way that is harmonious with their age, their risk tolerance, and their timeline to retirement, which means, in your parents' case, that it would want to be pretty conservative. I would say 50-50 stocks, bonds-ish. I'm not advocating that as a precise figure to follow, but somewhere in that ballpark neighborhood or somewhere in that range might be approximately reasonable for a person who is close to retirement. I'm going to take a whole different approach to Leslie's question, which is, while I can definitely appreciate the desire to want to preserve the money that they worked hard for, for their retirement, my question is, and I don't think we have enough information for this, where is the income going to come for them to retire? Mm -hmm. And how will they then stay retired? Because the problem isn't retiring. The problem is staying there. And so when I take a look at assets, I look at that as fuel for those retirement years. Generally speaking, early in your retirement, you might have the ability to work and fill in gaps, fill in retirement holes. Maybe it's a mandatory retirement that they have and they'll be working part time. But if I have to choose whether that money is going to be short term retirement money when they're younger or long-term retirement money to fill in the years when they might not be able to work, which is the number one reason why people stop working part-time anyway. Mm -hmm. I want to fill in those later years, which means for me, sticking with the equities, because that's probably still a ways in the future, might still be a great idea. And instead, I just take a look at the portfolio in general. You've got the TSP G fund, which for people that don't know what that is, is the government securities fund. So that is very low risk, very low reward uh, uh, government bonds. And on the other end, a fairly volatile, what sounds like a large, we don't know what fund it is, but sounds like a large company stock fund. There, Those are to use a football analogy, those are goalposts and there's a heck of a lot of room between those investments. And Paula, as an example, when you said something that might be a growth and income approach, that's a 50 50 is, is in the middle of that. So number one, I don't get the feeling that your parents are diversified enough. I'm not sure how to diversify because I don't know when the income stream's going to end. But what I would think about is that money as a fuel to reach those goals. What's cool about that is that if you're using that money to reach those goals and it turns out that I'm right, that that stock fund is for years that are still 20 years in the future or 15 years in the future where you want to make sure they have enough money to continue to live when they maybe can't even work part time then you're going to leave the money there. And what's cool is you don't have to worry about, and man, I can hear it in your voice, the volatility of now and preserving those funds, deciding to second guess a fund manager who has a lot of information and taking money out when the fund takes losses is a horrible strategy. You think about what a fund manager is, is hired to do. A fund manager is hired to buy individual securities. It's up to you, by the way, to make sure that that fund meets your goals. And if you don't have an active fund, if if that JP Morgan fund is a passive fund, still picking individual stocks, individual stocks do fantastic over long periods of time. They do horrible over short periods of time. But I think it's too early to land the plane. I think landing the plane is a fantastic analogy. You know, when you need the money, the plane is on the ground. I think that for money's 10, 15, 20 years out, you want to leave that money out in places that historically have done well over that time frame. So start off first with the time frame and then work backward to today. And I think that a lot of those investment decisions take care of themselves. So here is, I, I hear what you're saying. Here's my concern. She mentioned that when the recession hit and the economy tanked, her parents converted paper losses into real losses. And she also mentioned even now feeling a little bit jittery about the somewhat shakiness of the recent months. So I'm not hearing a huge level of comfort with market volatility. That, in addition to the compressed timeline, would make me see them as more suitable candidates for a less equities-based allocation. Well, I'm not sure. Once again, I don't have enough information, but because here's what I want to know. What I want to know first 
to reach any goal, there is, there's an equation and it's, you need to save so much money times so much return to get to the goal. And so they have an amount of money saved. We kind of know how much money they're going to save the next five years. So we can plug in X. If Y then is the return that we need. If we start with the end in mind and we know when they need the money and about how much they need, we can then calculate what return fairly easy with online calculators, uh, what return we're going to need on that money. And at that point, Paula, that's when we go to the asset class and we say, can I handle the volatility that's inherent in that asset class? Now, here's the thing about that. There are two different things that I worry about. One is, are you going to sleep at night? But number two, and this was also often the case, in many cases, it was just educating yourself. It was understanding how those assets work. When I, when I first rode, uh, going back to my airplane analogy, when I first rode on airplanes, every time the plane banked, I thought we were going into a nosedive. I was pretty sure that behind that closed door in the front of the plane, both pilots were screaming, we were all going to die. Later on, after playing a little bit of a Microsoft Flight Simulator on my computer, I realized that there's this whole system, and when the plane banked, we'd hit one of these one of these spots, one of these beacons where the plane was just working its way through the system. I started sleeping on planes where before I knew how they worked, I was panicked. So my question back would be, do you accept a lower volatility? And also, by the way, most probably a much lower return, or can you educate yourself once you know what assets are appropriate for that time frame? Can you find a way to accept that volatility? I don't know. Do you think that that would be difficult with three people all having to get on board? Because we're talking now about her and each parent. So what if you have the situation in which people have some financial education, one or two people can accept that volatility, but somebody else can't, and then all of a sudden it creates this tension or some arguments where now people are disagreeing about their investment choices? If I were the financial planner, I would worry that mom and dad can accept the volatility. Those are number one and two. It's their goal. It's their time frame. Their daughter accepting the volatility and second guessing their plan would drive me crazy. But I would be very pleased if mom and dad with their money can accept the volatility. So when you think about risk tolerance, there is the component of it that is your psychological risk tolerance, but then there's also the component of it that is your capacity to accept risk. Your statement is essentially is that their risk capacity is greater because their timeline is longer because they hopefully would be able to live on part-time income plus that rental income for a while before they have to tap their market investments. So the question then is not one of capacity, but rather one of psychology. Is that what I'm hearing correctly? Maybe I, I, I just approach this from, you have this hole to fill in. Mom and dad are going to retire in five years. Here is our expectation of longevity. We have this hole then, which is the amount of money they need to live on every year at that time. Then you and I ask ourselves, what part of that hole are we going to fill in? Logically, from my perspective, if I look at your ability to work, assuming that you can't fill in the entire hole, your ability to work is better up front. But if you told me, if you said, listen, I don't care about my older years, I'll live on Social Security, I'll, I'll do whatever it takes, well, then we fill in from the front of the hole and everything changes. I think there's a much bigger discussion there around what part of the hole we're going to fill in. But from where I sit, all things being equal, if you want to fund the entire retirement, you can't. You fund the early years by figuring out other income streams. You fund the later years with assets that you've already accumulated. And then I look at the appropriate investment to fit that. And then I go to my client. And once again, I'm not a financial planner now, but this is what I would do. I'd then go to my client and I'd say, here is the, uh, now in my world, it's called standard deviation and there's a second measure called beta that we would look at. We don't even need to go into those. We'll just call it the shakiness of these investments. We'd look at how much these investments are going to go up and down. And by the way, you can even look up how that works anywhere online. And it isn't that hard. It's actually fairly easy to understand that. 
but then that's when you have to take the mirror out and say, how much of this can I educate myself on to be able to sleep on the plane while we have volatility? Or am I going to wreck my own strategy? Because certainly taking money out again, when the market goes down again, would collapse everything. Right. And that's where I worry, particularly given that we're talking about a couple. We're talking about two people who both have to be on board with this plan. I think it's it's often hard to get couples to agree on anything. And when you have you when you have a couple who have already drawn down during a recession, they've already shown that at the time that stocks collapse, that's when they're they they have that past history of taking money out of the market during those moments. I think the likelihood of getting both people on board to not do it again is is difficult. I would agree with that, but I still don't think it's impossible. And I think it's where we need, we need to begin. We need to look at, you know, I've looked a lot lately at financial literacy in the United States and the, the numbers are absolutely horrible. One company, uh, nonprofit company, the, the TIA Foundation just recently did an index where people got about half the questions wrong in basic financial literacy areas. And without going too much into that, what that kind of means to me is that we need more education. We need a little bit more handholding. So I don't think it's impossible. I think we do have room that where we can grow and where I think that in the past, two people have been each other's maybe worst enemy, tucking each other into doing the wrong thing. I think a couple can also do a very good job of holding each other accountable. When one person wants to jump off the wagon, the other person says, no, this is our plan and we're sticking with it. It depends on the people. The sad thing here is that I don't know the people and I don't want to make an assumption about their financial literacy and about the mistakes that they made in the past. I don't know why they made those mistakes. I think that's an interesting conversation and a great place to start uh, hooking up a portfolio, which is other another neat part of the texture of this question, Paula. And I think now people can start to see why we talk about how personal personal finance is, is because even the investments we choose, even if we know all the data, those investments are still going to be different. And even though it comes down to math, right, Mm -hmm. that math equation and how you solve that equation is going to be different for all of us. If you need an 8% return on your money and you cannot sleep at night and there's no way that you're going to get educated uh, on those, on those assets, that number's got to go down, maybe to six, maybe to five. And if that number goes down to six or five, guess what has to happen? Well, then we either have to save more money, we have to live on less, we have to push the goal back. So something else has to give. How those numbers interface with each other uh, and interact with each other totally depends on these conversations that you and I are able to have right now with Leslie's parents. Well, thank you for asking that question, Leslie. I hope that shed some insight into the next steps. Hi, Paula. This is Samantha. I love your podcast and can't tell you how much you have inspired me to start my journey to financial freedom. This time last year, I decided to make more of an effort to chip away at my debt. And in the process, I've paid off about $17,000. I have another $14,000 to go. It's a mixture of student loans and credit cards. To pay off that much debt, I took on part-time jobs in addition to my full-time job. My question for you today is how do I calculate how much money I will owe the IRS in taxes? In total, in 2018, I think I made around $80,000. On my highest earning job, I claimed one, as well as two of the other jobs I worked this year. On the last, on my per diem, I claimed zero. Right now, the thought of owing a lot has me so stressed out, especially since I'm trying to pay off all this debt before next fall. Any advice you can give me will be a blessing. Hey, Samantha, I I completely understand where you're at. You don't want to have a huge tax bill that sends you spiraling back into debt when you're doing a great job of paying it off. So I love this idea of getting ahead of the game. Here is a problem. The IRS uh, just announced recently 
that at the end of May, they're going to have another draft out of what's going to be a brand new W4 system. And their goal is very similar to your goal, at least on one end. On one end, you don't want to owe a lot. They also don't want you to owe a lot. On the other end, though, they don't want people to get a lot of money back anymore inadvertently, which also makes sense for most of us because loaning the money to the government doesn't make a lot of sense. So the IRS has changed W-4s. In the first round of doing this, this is according to a piece recently in USA Today, the IRS already released one draft a few months ago And it looked absolutely horrifying. (laughs) It was so hard where your 1040 got a lot easier for most of us this year. If you do it yourself, you're nodding your head. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Got a ton easier. Itemized deductions, not the case for a lot of people anymore. Instead, now your W-4 that you fill out through work to try to have your withholding become more accurate is probably going to be a lot more difficult. In fact, referencing this piece which was written by uh, Jana Heron and appeared on April 9th. Jana writes, in the last draft, you wanted to come to the table with your non-wage income like interest and dividends, itemized and other deductions, income tax credits expected for the tax year. For employees with multiple jobs like you, total annual taxable wage for all lower paying jobs in the household. And then uh, one expert says it looked a lot more like a 1040 than a W-4. So a good news, bad news thing. The good news is, is it's going to get better. The bad news is it's going to change again. Now, will it change for this year? No, this is in anticipation of 2020. And then that means the taxes that you're working on this time, two years from now in 2021, uh, your tax filing will hopefully be a lot different where you won't owe a significant amount of money or you won't get a significant amount back. So two years from now, things will be better. <laughs> <laughs> Just hang in there for two years. <laughs> I thought that was interesting news, though. That is interesting news. Yeah, that is a major problem. And so, Samantha, I completely understand where you're coming from. Actually, just this morning, I sent an email to my CPA saying, hey, how much do I need to pay in estimated quarterly taxes? Because, pfft, I mean, it's hard to know sometimes. It's hard to know most of the time. So a couple of things that come to mind. Now, Samantha, you said that you have been paying off your debt by working another job. From the way that you phrased the question, and from what I think I understand, I'm getting the impression that none of these are in the form of self-employment, that in both your full-time job as well as your part-time job, these both come in the form of being employed by somebody else. And if that is the case, then by increasing your withholdings, so by by putting your withholdings at a, a one or a two, if you really wanted to be aggressive, you could have most of those taxes taken out of each paycheck up front so that you then don't have to worry as much about paying a big tax bill on April 15th. Now, of course, if you had a side hustle that came in the form of self-employment, that would be different. There's a lot of additional complexity that comes with trying to figure out what your tax bill is going to be when you're self-employed. But from what I'm understanding, that doesn't seem to be the case with you. So if you are worried about it, I would I would increase your withholdings. And in the meantime, keep cash on hand so that in case you do have a big bill at tax time, you have some funds to prepare for that. But but at least in the future, moving forward, increase your withholding so that that's less of an issue. Yeah, the way that the system works now, and especially since you, you have multiple income streams, it's going to be difficult to pinpoint it. So Paula, your advice of of raising across the board your withholding is is great advice. A way to try to turn this art a little bit into science, if you do your taxes yourself, many of the off-the-shelf programs out there to help you do your taxes, if you use one of them, look for one of the side programs in there, which can help you tweak your withholding. So you can actually ask the question, what if I'm getting too much money back? And you can run some scenarios based on your current income streams or based on projections of how it's going to change next year. And uh, your tax software might help you. 
might not be exactly right, but it's probably closer than just throwing a dart. Right, exactly. But it is a major problem. These things are very hard to predict. They're hard to know. And particularly, you're very, I mean, there are so many different deductions out there as well that that are going to affect this. So either talking to a CPA or having or using tax filing software will get you the most accurate estimate. But given how many variables there are, and given the fact that things can change these things come up throughout the year that you cannot plan for that that affect your taxes. And so as a self-employed person, I've always protected myself from sending slight overpayments to the IRS whenever I make my estimated quarterly tax payments, you know, which is not efficient. It's not ideal, but it's a way that I've protected myself against having to pay interest to the IRS if I have accidentally underpaid them. That's one way that you can do it. And of course, if you work for somebody else, then upping the withholdings is the employee equivalent of that. Final thing that I want to say, Samantha, congratulations on paying off so much debt already and on being so focused on finishing out the repayment of your debt. Congratulations on all of the hard work that you're doing, because it's really wonderful to see someone who is making so much progress. You're you're doing everything right. You're paying attention to your debt. You're you're taking on that second job. You're listening to personal finance podcasts. You're calling in with questions. You are on the right track and you're doing so much that's so good. Steve, can we get a round of applause, please? So Savannah, that's the last thing that I want to say is a huge congratulations to you for everything that you're doing, because I'm, I'm very, very proud of you and very happy for you. Our next question comes from Claire. Hi, Paula. I'm doing one week a week, and I know that soon I need to write a will. And I'd like your help in framing some questions to ask myself about how to write a will that's in line with my personal values and what my ideal life is. I'm a mother and I've got two children and happily married. I want to make sure that the will is a true reflection of who I am and who I want to be. And I also want to know, should my will look like my husband's? He can get a will for free through work. I can't. So I want to know if if we write a will, should they look very similar? Thanks. Claire, first of all, thank you for being part of the One Tweak a Week community. Now, for listeners who are new to this podcast who are wondering what that is, One Tweak a Week is my free ebook and free email series and free Facebook community as well of people who are doing one action item every week over the course of 26 weeks that make some type of improvement in their financial life. This is a series of 26 things that you can do. Each thing takes about an hour. The the exception, of course, is this question, estate planning, which is going to take more than that. But most of the things in that uh, ebook take about an hour. Some of them are even as short as five minutes. And they're not huge game changers, but added up together, they make a difference in your financial life. So if anybody wants to download that, you can download it for free at affordanything.com slash 2019. That's affordanything.com slash 2019. So Claire, to answer your question about writing a will. Now, first of all, I'm going to pause here and give the disclaimer, I am not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. This is for entertainment only. And you may want to consult an outside professional, an estate planning professional. The way in which you handle that ties very well with the first part of your question, which is a slightly more philosophical question of how do you write a will or create an estate plan that is a reflection of your values. And that's not something that I can really answer for you because I can't tell you what your values are, whether that is to give money to particular charities or nonprofits, or whether that is to give money to your descendants or to other family members or to friends. These are all very, very personal questions. It's fundamentally the question of what type of legacy do I want to live, at least in a material way? There are ways, of course, that we leave legacies through our words, our teachings, many, many ways in which we leave a legacy. But in terms of actual material assets, in what ways do I want those assets to impact the world after I am gone? That's the question that you start with. And then you 
create an estate plan to the best of your ability that reflects that? It's interesting. I've found myself in the center of a few discussions on this topic because of the fact that there's a there's a central there's a central point that I don't know the answer to that that it's important to to define first and that is how much when it comes to your values how much ruling from beyond the grave do you think is appropriate for some people that's not even a question it's well of course i i want to see x y and z happen and i can define what those things have been for other people in the past that i've talked to or people that that were clients of mine for some other people it's well i've passed away and i think i'm gone so however they use the money it's it's or use whatever i left behind that's completely completely up to them but when it comes to your values i'll tell you some things that people have done in the past it is possible to have multiple beneficiaries on your life insurance policies so if you want to give money to certain charities or split it in a way differently than the way uh, most people do the way most people do, by the way, is your spouse is first and the children are second, or if you're the second to die, your children then split the proceeds equally. You can also have some other group, some other people, some other charity people that you want to uh, say thank you to, uh, whatever you can do those things. You can also do that with your beneficiary of your 401k or, or something there. Uh, likewise, your will can be as long as you want it to be. You, you know, those old, well, Paula, you don't watch, you don't watch movies. I almost asked you about a movie reference. Whoa, what, what, Joe, what how I, long have you known me? I know, but Paula, there are these things called movies and in <laughs> them, what, what, what you'll see sometimes is the family sits around and they read a will and there'll be this long preamble. You can do that in your will. You can specify that everybody has to sit around and listen to your will being read. No, not many people do that, but, but you can do that. And you can include whatever language you want to have. You can also include, and these will require working with attorneys, and it depends on what state you live in. Uh, what country you live in, the laws in your area, you may be able to have some provisions that are that are found in more complex estate plans like a trust where your beneficiaries don't get your money right away. There were some people that I worked with that didn't want their children to have all of their money when they were 18. I mean, I was 18. <laughs> I was 18 at one point. I probably would not have done things as prudently as I might have later on. With a straightforward will in many places, you're not allowed to protect your assets beyond your child's age of majority if you've if you've passed away. But what some people were able to do is, you know, they made the first money available as needed, maybe to get through school or starting a career or whatever that might be. And then maybe a third of the money at 21 or 22, then a third at late 20s and then another third in, in the mid 30s. I don't know. You can do things like that. So there are plenty of things you can do. I think the first question is getting back, Paula, to your question. What are your values? What do you think? But but really with a will, anything is possible and it doesn't have to look exactly like your husband's. Just realize if you pass away first and some of the money goes to him, that things will then look, may look differently if he has different provisions in his will. And I do think that it is well worth the money to hire an estate planning advisor. I totally do. And man, I see this question all the time and it kind of drives me crazy. And not from the, the fee aspect, because I get it, Paula, when you work with an estate planning attorney and you look at the documents, they look suspiciously <laughs> Like the same documents you get when you get the do-it-yourself will kit. They they don't look that much different. And they're working with some of these documents to just fill in, in the numbers. But they number one, they've been through this before. Number two, if you die any time in the next several years and you use the do-it-yourself will kit, you know the first thing your family's going to have to do? They're going to have to go hire an attorney to help them figure out what to do next. Uh, they don't have to do that, but most people do that. And so even though you saved a little money today, 
you probably cost your your family and the proceeds of your estate money down the road. I like predetermining the attorney that my family will work with if I die any time in the next, you know, depending on how old you are and how old your attorney is, the next, let's say, maybe 10 to 15 years. And you can then feel much more certain that uh, things will be handled the way that you hope they're handled because you interviewed the person who's going to work with your family ahead of time. Mm-hmm. I also like the idea of working with an estate planning expert simply because they will ask questions that you might not have thought about asking, or they will point out blind spots. You don't know what you don't know. And when it comes to estate planning, we're talking about the fate of everything you've ever worked for. So it seems well worth it to spend a little bit of money, a a fraction, a tiny fraction of your estate, making sure that you have at least a second set of eyes on the remainder of it. Thank you, Claire, for asking that question. Our next question is from Maxime. Hi, Paula. My name is Maxime. I'm 37 years old, and I am a new listener. I discovered your podcast thanks to the Susie Orman episode, and you guys are natural, awesome, and full of good advice. I'm learning so much thanks to you guys. Paula, here's my question. All of my 401k funds are expensive and the lowest one I found, it's an S&P 500 index with an expense ratio of 0.87%. My question is, should I invest in the 401k or should I invest in an individual account such like a Vanguard S&P 500, which has, I think, an expense ratio of 0.04%? Or should I do 50-50 or... I don't know. Whatever you think is right, I would love to have uh, your opinion on that. Just to let you know, my boss does not match what I'm making because I'm making a six-figure salary. And the only advantage I can see is that it is pre-taxed. Thank you so much for your feedback, Paula, and keep up the good work. Maxime, thank you so much for finding this episode. I'm glad that you came in through the Susie Orman episode. That is a Afford Anything classic. So welcome to this community and thank you so much for calling in. Here's what I would say, especially given that your employer does not match your 401k contributions, I would first put $6,000 per year into an IRA because you can control where that IRA is located. So if you choose to, you can open an IRA account with Vanguard, which then gives you the ability to buy Vanguard funds. And it's your choice whether you want this to be a pre-tax traditional IRA or whether you want this to be a after-tax slash tax-exempt Roth IRA. That part is totally up to you. If there's a possibility that your income is too high for you to qualify for a Roth IRA, then you you would have to do a slightly more complicated version of that that's referred to as a backdoor Roth conversion, which means that you first put money into a traditional IRA and then you convert that money into a Roth IRA once it's in there. But regardless of what type of IRA you choose, whether traditional or Roth, you know, largely depending on what your current income is, you mentioned it's six figures, but I don't know where in the six figure range we're talking about here. Regardless of where that is, you can at a minimum open an account with Vanguard, create an IRA there, and put $6,000 per year there. You're 37 years old, so 6000 is going to be your annual maximum. Once you are above the age of 50, then you can put in and then you can put in $7,000 because you can add an additional $1,000 contribution after the age of 50. So you've got that to look forward to. So uh, that's what I would do. And then after that, First $6,000 contribution, then any remaining funds that you want to invest, you can put it in your 401k, or if you qualify for an HSA, you could also put it there. Or depending on your goals, if you wanted to put it into a savings account or so that you could save up for starting your own business or for buying a rental property. I mean, largely at this point, the question becomes, what type of investments do you want to make? But assuming that you only want to make market investments, then I would go IRA first And then once that's maxed out, then go 401k. Yeah, if he needs the pre-tax deferral, which is the way that he's doing it now, Paula, Mm -hmm. really the 401k is your only only option to get that done, depending on how far into six-figure range he is. That's going to depend on both his income and his marital status. Maxime, just so you know what the limits are, 
if you are married filing jointly and your modified adjusted gross income is $103,000 or less, you can contribute to a traditional IRA and take a full deduction. If you make more than $103,000 but less than $123,000, then you can still contribute to a traditional IRA, but you only get a partial deduction rather than the full deduction. And if your income is above $123,000, then you do not get a deduction for money that you put into a traditional IRA. So again, I don't know if you're single or married, and I don't know where in the six figures you're earning. If you're earning $100,000 versus $120,000 or versus $150,000, right? So depending on your marital status and also depending on where in the six-figure range you're making, that's going to impact whether or not you can take a deduction if you contribute to a traditional IRA, and if so, how much of one. And if you do need that pre-tax 401k, I would not let a 0.87% investment fee get in your way. I completely wouldn't. I think when I look at the incredible range of investment fees, I know that that is slightly above the median for the industry now. I believe the the median, and this is off the top of my head, I apologize, but it's around 0.6. So yes, it's a little high, but it also depends on what type of a fund it is, which we don't know what type of a fund it is. Historically, if you have an emerging market fund or an international fund, those funds, uh, those funds will have a higher, will have some higher fees attached to them if they're actively managed. Plus, actively managed funds will have higher fees than passively managed funds. So I don't know if you've you've checked uh, those funds, but it sounds like the, the, like you probably have. I don't think the reason you're going to reach your goal or not is because of a 0.87% management fee. I certainly think that fees are important and you should adequately manage your fee structure. Lower fees does not necessarily always translate to better. And in this case, if I have to choose between my only avenue at getting pre-tax money and avoiding a point eight seven percent fee on my funds, I will accept the zero point eight seven percent fee because the tax shelter is way, way, way worth it if I need it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's sort of another way of saying that even though the fees on that account are a bit higher, the advantage that you get from putting it into a tax advantaged account as compared with a taxable brokerage account still make it a net positive. But I see too many people do this, Paula, where they go, oh, my 401k through work stinks, so I don't invest in it. Mm. And they can't really save anywhere else. Now, number one, you can get around that by using a Roth IRA outside, assuming that that's the type of tax shelter that fits. So there are ways around it. But I see people not even do that. They're like, well, I don't like the place I work, so I don't invest money. (laughs) Yeah, you end up shooting yourself in the foot because you don't like your company. The other good news is even if you don't like your company, which is not the case for Maxime, but for people that don't like their company and aren't investing in the 401k because of that, 401ks are very rarely run by the company that you work for. They outsource that to a third party that is a money management firm like a Fidelity or maybe a Vanguard or maybe uh, some other big fund company that has done this before. So I certainly want to look first at my tech strategy And I want to be mindful of my fees, but of the two, I want to make sure that I have the right tax strategy first. Yeah, absolutely. Now, a good reason, you know, this kind of goes back, Joe, to what we were talking about earlier. There are good reasons and bad reasons to make varying decisions, right? So if the question is, I think that I want to be able to access this money before the age of 59 and a half, so should I put it into a 401k in order to get the tax advantage, or should I put it into a taxable brokerage account so that I can have the flexibility to access it in 15 years? That would be a very, very valid reason to open a taxable brokerage account at Vanguard, right? Sure. You might have two different people taking exactly the same set of actions, but the motivation behind those actions are the difference maker. So... If the motivation to not put money in a 401k is that the only funds that you're eligible to invest in through your employer 401k are 
funds that have a 0.86 or 0.87 expense ratio. And because of that, you're not taking advantage of the tax advantage. That is not a sufficiently high expense ratio in order to avoid that. But if you have a totally different reason for opening up a taxable brokerage account, such as accessibility, okay, well, that's a valid reason. Again, it could be exactly the same action, but the motivation is what matters. Yeah. I also want to put a little asterisk in here. The numbers that I talked about, the modified adjusted gross income of $123,000 being the limit at which you can take some type of a deduction if you are married filing jointly, that applies to people who are covered by a retirement plan with an employer, which, Maxime, is your case. If you do not have a retirement plan through an employer, then your limits are different. Your limits are, if you're married filing jointly, 203000 That's the cutoff limit for being able to take either a partial deduction or a full deduction. Assuming you're married filing jointly, you do not have an, a retirement plan through an employer, and we're talking about the 2019 traditional IRA. But Maxime, that's not the case for you. You do have a retirement plan through an employer. Thank you, Joe, for joining us today. Where can people find you if they want to hear more of your wacky ideas? <laughs> my, my crazy, my crazy ideas. You can find me Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the Stacking Benjamins podcast and on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday at the Money in the Morning podcast looking at headlines like this new headline you and I just talked about today about W-4 withholding changing all kinds of nerdy headlines out there and we define them, and break them down. So uh, that was one of the headlines, Paula, we talked about uh, on a show a couple of weeks ago. Nice. During this recording, when you said this headline comes to us from USA Today, I was like, wait a minute, are we recording a Stacking Benjamins right now? <laughs> it totally sounded like it, didn't it? It did. It did. I had this brief moment where I was like, what? Wait, what are we recording? We're still in my what? show, right? Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> and thanks, everybody, for some great questions. As you know, Paula, it takes so much bravery to ask questions that are so near and dear to your heart, you know? I mean, so many so many people don't talk about their money at all, and it's really exciting to see people opening up and uh, allowing us to help you have these great conversations about money. Absolutely. So thank you so much to everybody who called in with a question. If you have a question, you can submit it at affordanything.com slash voicemail. That's affordanything.com slash voicemail. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share this episode with a friend or a family member. If you know somebody who has a question that's similar to one of the questions that you heard on today's episode, if you know somebody who's going through a similar stage or phase in life, share this episode with them. Coming up on next week's episode, Dr. Sarah Falla joins us to talk about the next millionaire next door. Dr. Falla is the daughter of one of the original authors of The Millionaire Next Door, and she and her now late father, prior to his death, they embarked on a big research project together where they gathered information about self-made American millionaires so that they could find out how the average American millionaire is different today than he or she was 20 years ago when the book The Millionaire Next Door came out. So she is going to join us on next week's episode to discuss the modern Millionaire Next Door. Make sure that you hit subscribe in whatever app you're using to listen to podcasts, whether you're using Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Pandora, YouTube. Make sure that you subscribe so that you don't miss any upcoming episodes, including that one, because that one is going to be amazing. My name is Paula Pant. This is the Afford Anything Podcast. Thank you for listening, and I'll catch you next week. Yes, if you are interested in going to a retreat in which people get together in a beautiful tropical country and talk about financial independence, we are hosting a Chautauqua in Ecuador in November. You'll be spending a week with myself, Leaf from Physician on Fire, and Steve from Think Save Retire. And we'll be talking about meaning, purpose, life before and after financial independence. The deadline to register is Wednesday the 24th. If you are interested, go to AboveTheCloudsRetreats.com. That's AboveTheCloudsRetreats.com. If you're on the fence, you're not sure you can make it, send an email to AboveTheCloudsRetreats at Hotmail.com. Just send that email by Wednesday the 24th. Thanks. Hope to see you there.